Mark Pearson joins Viewpoint on Sky News Live. Welcome back. You're watching a Sunday Agenda. We've been talking to Mark Butler from the Labor Party. We're joined now by the Major Projects Minister, Paul Fletcher. Thanks very much for your company. Good morning. Good to be with you. Do you hope to stay in the same portfolio uh, when the reshuffle is announced, or are you hoping to move on to bigger and better things? Well, as the expression goes, that's a matter for the Prime Minister, but certainly I've enjoyed my time as Major Projects Minister about nine months, uh, and obviously there's a, a significant agenda. The Turnbull Government uh, has a commitment of about $50 billion between 2013-14 and 2019-20 on infrastructure projects all around the country. Infrastructure so important to productivity and also, of course, to livability, the livability of our cities, which is one of our biggest assets. So, Can I ask you on that? I mean, one of the big talking points post the election seems to be that the Senate is going to be so hard to deal with in a policy sense. Does that have much impact on your infrastructure agenda, getting things through the Senate, or is there a way, uh, is there a way through that is easier in the sorts of areas that you've got responsibility for? Look, I think, first of all, obviously, we will um, con we'll have a majority in the House of Representatives. We now know that. And we'll be dealing with a Senate where we don't have a majority. In a sense, um, that's, that's not new. That's the situation we were in in the previous government. I think the second thing to say is that if you look at a range of the priorities in the infrastructure space, uh, so quite a number of them uh, don't involve uh, legislative action. There certainly are areas of, of legislative action, but. If I look, for example, at uh, Western Sydney Airport, which is a significant priority, um, the Abbott government committed to proceed with Western Sydney Airport at Badgerys Creek, the Turnbull government very strongly pursuing that, um, uh, the airport uh, scheduled to be open by the mid-2020s, very important for Western Sydney, very important for Sydney, very important for Australia. Now, there's a lot of work we have to do. Um, a lot of the terms of that are, are determined, for example, by the original contractual agreements when uh, Sydney Airport was um, sold to the private sector. So there's what's called a right of first refusal. Mm. We need to work through all of that. So an enormous amount of work to do. My point is that um, it's not principally legislative. So there's a mix of legislative and non-legislative uh, issues that we need to deal with. But in the infrastructure space and in the major project space, a fair amount of it is engagement with state governments. Uh, with uh, indeed local councils and with uh, private sector stakeholders such as, for example, the owners of Sydney Airport. Because the more you can avoid the Senate, the better. You'd have to agree, uh, notwithstanding the fact that the government was in a difficult position last September when it changed Prime Ministers, it has now won an election, done so with a majority. We'll see whether it's 76 or 77, depending on the seat of Herbert. But the play for the DD election, the play for the trigger, uh, that has to be categorised as a failure, uh, now needing around nine cross benches to be able to get legislation through, you would have to think. Uh, well, I don't think I'd agree with that. I mean, the first point to make is the counting is still going on in the Senate, but clearly... You're not going to make up nine positions. I mean, clearly it's a more difficult Senate to deal with no matter what happens in that count from here versus what was in place before the election. Well, the point I just want to make in relation to the double dissolution triggers, the registered organisations... Uh, bill and the ABCC Australian Building Construction uh, Commission legislation is that, as the Prime Minister has said, um, there's a process you need to go through under the provisions of the Constitution that deal with double dissolutions and then you, how you deal with the joint sitting afterwards. The first thing you need to do is then take those bills back to the reps and the Senate in the normal way. Then, uh, if you don't get through, then you have the joint sitting. So we certainly, um, you know, it's our, it's our policy and we fought an election uh, on this commitment that we intend to take those to a joint sitting and we'll, we'll work through that. Of course, we need to know the final composition of the Senate, but we'll be engaging with the Senate, uh, you know, in a constructive, respectful fashion, uh, looking to um, uh, make the case for the merits of our legislation. That's what governments always do. And as many, as many people have observed, it's pretty unusual, actually, in recent political history uh, for government to have a majority in the Senate. So, in a sense, yes, of course, the composition of the Senate has changed from the previous Senate. That always happens after every election. Uh, but the fundamentals of the fact that we're dealing with a Senate where we don't have a majority, um, that's by no means unprecedented territory, quite the opposite. Mr Fletcher, can I ask you about the joint sitting? Because uh, the government does not need to hold a joint sitting. There's no obligation upon the government to do that. Um, and, of course, after the 1987 um, double dissolution election, the Hawke government did not proceed with a joint sitting over the Australia card because of a regulatory glitch uh, with that, which would have made it um, ir irrelevant um, to hold that uh, joint sitting because the bill could have been later disallowed. But in any event, um, if the government does not have the numbers in a joint sitting, why would you proceed with a joint sitting? 
Well, look, I think we're sort of getting ourselves ahead of ourselves a little bit with that question. The first thing we need to do is have the um, counting in the Senate finished so that we know precisely what the composition of the Senate is. The second thing is we need to go through all of the processes that the Constitution requires you go to before you can have a joint sitting. And then, of course, there's the question of the joint sitting itself. So we'll work through all of that. The arguments that we took to the Australian people at this election about why we need to have a registered organisations bill so that people who are in control of unions uh, have duties and obligations to their members in terms of how they deal with money, uh, how they act on behalf of their members. I mean, we saw uh, with the Royal Commission into Trade Unions, we saw that the Australian Workers' Union was doing deals with companies which were in the interest of the AWU, which gave it more delegate chips within the Labor Party, but, this is but the which point, were though, not Paul in Fletcher. the interests of of but, union members. Sure, so, but this is the point, though. So you, you've had this early election, the longest election campaign in modern history. Uh, the Turnbull gamble was a success. You won the election with a majority. But the timing of the election, the long campaign, the choice of the trigger, uh, Michaelia Cash said that she would release the government's response to the very Trade Union Royal Commission you referred to during the campaign on this program. It never happened ahead of polling day. Uh, you've got the One Nation genie let out of the bottle now. Uh, as a result of having the quota halved for the Senate in a DD election. That element of what has transpired has been an unmitigated failure. Well, the simple point I'm making in relation to the measures that we took to the election, that we said we were campaigning on, the registered organisations bill, the Australian Building Construction Commission, we said uh, this is legislation that we've twice uh, taken to the House of Representatives and the Senate. We think it's very important. We think it's important in the interests of union members. Look, unions have an important role to play in our society, but it is important that union officials are acting in the interests of their members, and we've seen troubling evidence in the Royal Commission that, in fact, they were more interested in securing delegate ships within the Labor Party and doing deals under which money came into the coffers of the union and actually trading away the rights of their members. Okay, now, but, but in, I... in business, that would be called a breach of fiduciary duty. Sure, that is this, why this, this, it's this so debate... important that we have this registered organisations uh, legislation. So we will continue to make the cases to the merits of that. Also, the Australian Building Construction Commission. I mean, we have a situation in this country where the rule of law often does not prevail on building sites because the CFMEU effectively um, controls what goes on. We've seen instance after instance of judges uh, uh, observing that the CFMEU essentially seems to uh, ignore the law to regard the payment of fines as simply a cost of doing business. And so we need to restore the rule of law on building sites. This is a very important industry, the construction sector. Uh, it employs uh, well over a million Australians. It's important to our, uh, our productivity and to our economic growth. And so this has been uh, this was a trigger for the election, and uh, this is an important issue. Yeah, well, you're exactly right. I mean, I don't disagree with anything that you've just said there, but the fact is you're not going to have the numbers in, in a joint sitting, um, and the relationship with the crossbench in the Senate is going to be more difficult because it's larger. I wanted to ask you about the personal relationships with a number of these crossbench senators because we had the Prime Minister say that Pauline Hanson was not welcome back in Australian politics, yet she's likely to command three Senate votes. I mean, how can you as a minister sit in front of Pauline Hanson, for example, um, and expect to get her to pass your legislation when when the Prime Minister made it clear she was not welcome um, in, back in Australian politics? Look, what I anticipate will happen will be that when I, as a minister or any of my ministerial counterparts, um, have legislation to take forward, we will go around and brief uh, the relevant um, parties in the Senate. That's all of the parties, and that's what you routinely do. You go and uh, uh, brief them, you have a meeting, you explain what the issues are, you take away questions. Uh, there may be things you then need to respond to in more detail. That's the way that you engage with the Senate. That's what we've been doing. But do you agree that she's not welcome in Australian politics? Uh, the, the, the point I'm making is that as a government, we will engage with the Senate in a constructive, respectful, business-like way. We have a duty to the Australian people uh, to govern. And that includes, of course, engaging with the Senate. And um, that includes engaging uh, with the senators who have been elected. So oh, that's what we'll be doing. I want to ask you about uh, women in politics. Mm. The Liberal Party's numbers have gone down. Maurice Payne was very scathing about that in some comments that she made during the week. 
Does the Liberal Party need to take this issue seriously? We've heard all this talk for a long, long time now, and yet the numbers are going south, not mm. north. Well, can I say we've got some excellent women coming in? Not enough, Cole, though. That's Nicole, my point. Nicole Flint and Boothby. Uh, Julie but you've Banks got in, less in, in total look, we do. than some, you had before some, the last Some election. excellent uh, colleagues, sadly, have not been returned at this election. Uh, women who've made a big impact. But hang on, but hang on, hang on. It's not just about people that have lost their seats. It's about women not being replaced by other women. So even if you'd won Sharman Stone's old seat, it was a man that was running. Jason Falinski, again, a yeah, man sure, running Nicole, in Bronwyn Bishop's old seat. Flint replaced a man in Boothby. In other words, it goes both But if ways. we go through it all, look, do, do, there were more women running at the 2013 election than there were running at this election in winnable seats, not just the fact that you then also have a lower quantum in the after. Uh, is it important that we continue our efforts to build the number of women in the parliamentary, Liberal and National parties? Yes. I mean, it, I am very pleased that we have a woman as Deputy Leader of the Liberal Party in Julie Bish, that we, Bishop. We have Fiona Nash as the uh, Deputy Leader of the National Party. We have uh, a number of women in Cabinet. And that's is it time to look at something firmer? I'm not talking quotas, but I'm talking at least formal targets. I mean, you come from a strong business background. You would know as well as anyone that businesses have targets and businesses can make those targets meaningful because they have KPIs all the way down the line, mm. bonuses to executives to hit those targets, etc. Now, you don't have that in politics. So you either have a quota and it's firm, or if you have a target, you've got to create some KPIs to go mm, with I it. I hope you're not suggesting bonuses for politicians, because that would no, be, I'm I think, not a very that, unpopular but, policy. But, but, but I, you know I what I'm saying? The, the, the reason that business actually makes targets work and gets something resembling gender parity is because they put it in their KPIs and everyone down through the line at the business is trying to make sure that those promotions happen. Whereas in politics, someone at the top says, yeah, we need more women, and then nothing happens. Uh, look. I, I, don't, I don't want to get into a debate about um, particular mechanisms. Uh, certainly, I saw what Maurice has to say, had to say. Maurice is a very uh, obviously respected, extremely senior member of the Parliamentary Liberal Party. Uh, she's a strong, effective politician, very strong, effective politician. She's been a long-standing champion for the role of women in politics, and um, uh, clearly. Um, uh, th these are issues she has strong views about and, and these are issues that many of us have views about. It, it is important that we uh, have a strong representation of women in the, in the parliament and that in, the, in, in the Liberal Party and in the National Party. Um, we but doesn't do something have to change to achieve that? I guess that's my point. Well, one of the, one of the, one of the I'd make a couple of points. The first is um, you sort of dismiss the fact that uh, there were women MPs who lost. There are women MPs, Liberal women MPs, who lost, uh, in part thanks to, you know, a dishonest camp scare campaign about Medicare. Um, but the, the, the point is that there are some ups and downs in politics, um, and that's inevitable in the, in the vagaries of election outcomes. Um, but do, is it important that we continue to uh, increase, work to increase the number of women in the Parliamentary Liberal Party, and uh, my, in my view, yes, it is. Um, uh, I think we have a lot to be proud of, but there's always more work to do. Can I ask you about the front bench, which is um, how Peter started off this interview? Um, there's a number of suggestions around the place that a number of former ministers should return to the front bench, whether that's Erica Betts um, or Kevin Andrews or indeed Tony Abbott. Um, what's your view about that? Should a place be found for these people on the front bench? Uh, my view is that it's a matter for the Prime Minister. <laughs> Look, can I say, we've got a lot of talent in the Parliamentary Liberal Party and in the National Party. That's, uh, that's a good position to be in. Um, we've got very capable people. We've had an influx of very capable people at this election. Uh, I'm absolutely delighted by the quality of the people we've had come into the uh, Parliamentary Liberal and National Parties. Um, but these are matters for the Prime Minister. He will weigh up a whole range of factors and he'll be announcing the decisions reasonably soon, so we'll wait and see what he but has to say. Wouldn't, wouldn't it make sense to give Tony Abbott some kind of role, um, in, in a sense, to foster unity in the party, to channel his energies in a particular direction? Um, could you see a role for Tony Abbott, if not on the front bench, but another particular role, perhaps prosecuting the referendum on Indigenous recognition, for example? Or is there anything else that you think Tony Abbott should do, or should he just be a backbencher seeing constituents? Well, again, that's a matter for the Prime Minister. Can I just say, Tony Abbott has given extraordinary service to this nation over many, many years um, as, a, as a member for Warringah since 1994, uh, as a minister, as a cabinet minister, as prime minister. Uh, I'm very pleased that he's again 
serving the people. Um, his first job is to serve the people of Warringa, just as my first job is to serve the people of Bradfield. All of us in the House of Representatives, our first job is to serve our constituents. Uh, but then there are many other ways we can make contributions. Tony has a lot to offer, but it's really a matter for the Prime Minister. Just finally, uh, Troy mentioned that there's this sort of push for Tony Abbott and perhaps others to uh, move on to the front bench. Is there really a push for it? I mean, I do know that there are some commentators and that there are the same names that I see popping up suggesting it, but it doesn't strike me as anything beyond uh, a small quotient of individuals doing that. Look, the Prime Minister uh, has the task before him of uh, identifying and announcing his front bench. He's made the point he doesn't expect there to be big changes. He's made the point that um, he pretty comprehensively uh, changed the uh, composition of Cabinet and Ministry uh, in September. There were further changes earlier this year. So he's, got, he's had a lot of renewal. Uh, he has made that point. Um, and his focus will be, you talked about business principles before, his focus will be, I'm sure, uh, choosing an effective team which can deliver outcomes for the Australian people. Because we're in government, uh, we've returned to government. Uh, <laughs> you know, Labor's been having this so-called victory lap, but they lost, they didn't win. We've won, and we are focused on the job of governing for the Australian people. That is our task. And all of these questions about personalities, that's really a bit second order. What matters is an effective government delivering outcomes for the Australian people. Well, I suspect we'll find out the composition of that front bench perhaps even as early as tomorrow afternoon. Paul Fletcher, we appreciate you joining us on Sunday Agenda. Thanks for your Thanks company. Thanks very much. Troy Bramson, thanks for your company. I'll see you again at the same time next week. Paul Kelly continues to be on leave. He'll be on leave again next Sunday. Stay with us, though, here at Sky News. We'll have Sportsline when we come back.